welcome to Franklin Covey's On Leadership series, now the fastest growing, largest leadership newsletter of its kind. If you're not subscribing, be sure to visit franklincovey.com, click on the On Leadership tab, and we'll send you this newsletter every Tuesday morning at about 6.01 Eastern Time, where we feature a different video and audio interview each week. Sometimes it's an expert inside Franklin Covey, and other times it's a best-selling author, business CEO, thought leader on a best-selling book, or a really interesting idea on how to build our leadership skills. Subscribe yourself, your family, your team. We'd love to have you be a part of it. It's all complimentary. Each week, there's a video interview that can also be consumed in podcast, as well as a downloadable tool and a blog that I write with a little interesting idea on what I learned during the interview. Now, occasionally, I'm invited to share what we call kind of Scott's thoughts, an interesting idea that I've gleaned over the last several interviews or my own leadership experience. And today I'm going to talk about the six critical practices for leading a team. So I've been privileged to be a co-author of a new book coming out called Everyone Deserves a Great Manager. This book was co-authored with Franklin Covey's Chief People Officer, Todd Davis, and one of our senior leadership consultants, Victoria Roos Olson. Now the theme is everyone deserves a great manager. We've gotten a lot of feedback on, so should I be a leader, should I be a manager? For the purpose of the book and for today's conversation, we kind of use those terms you know, interchangeably. Everybody's got an opinion on what and when should you manage and what and who should you lead. But for today, let's just assume they're both the same things because there's times in our lives where we need to manage and there's times where we need to lead. And sometimes some could, could benefit from being you know, more of one or less of the other. Of these six critical practices for leading a team, I have great passion about a lot of them. I love the, the practice around you know, one-on-ones and providing great feedback to your team and receiving it as well. My favorite probably is the first one. That's called develop a leader's mindset. Now, at Franklin Covey, you know, we use the word mindset a, a lot, right? It's kind of like your paradigm. And your paradigm is probably an overused word, but the concept is, is no less relevant now than it was when Dr. Covey talked about it you know, 30 years ago in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which, by the way, is in its 30th year. And can you believe it sold 30 million copies. Your paradigm, of course, is your belief system. It's your mindset. It's the way in which you see yourself, your boss, your family, your friends, your community, your clients, the marketplace, the world. All of our mindsets, our paradigms, are deeply enculturated in us since birth, right? My parents taught me to believe that police officers and judges and Catholic priests always told the truth and were always right. Poppycock, right? That's not true. Catholic priests don't always tell the truth, right? Newsflash. But we're, we're taught to believe things that are true. We're also taught to believe that leaders behave a certain way. And when someone becomes a leader, they need both a new mindset, tool set, and skill set. Because I believe that the following is very true. Most leaders are promoted into their first leadership position too often because they were the best at their job. They were the best digital designer or they were the top salesperson, or the most efficient, or pleasant, or agreeable, or perhaps competent dental hygienist. And because they were best at what they did, someone along the way thought they'd make a great leader. Which is insane, because the skills that make you a great salesperson most emphatically do not make you a great sales leader. Think about it. I was, at one point, the top sales producer in my division here at Franklin Covey. Had no leadership responsibility. My job was to hit my revenue target by providing solutions that clients wanted and needed that solved their results. Now, what that required from me was a lot of skills, right? Great forecasting, a lot of face-to-face -face meetings, a lot of bird-dogging for appointments, being on time with clients, being a great communicator. With that came a sense of competition. I wanted to you know, beat the others in my division by winning my sales goal. I liked being at the top of the charts. I liked the fame and the significance that came with that. I think that's fine. I think those are actually good things to have when you're a salesperson. You need other skills, right? You need empathy skills and great listening skills. But generally, kind of a get it done at all cost mentality 
often allows you to kind of throw your body over the finish line at the end of the quarter or the year to make your sales goal because salespeople are heavily driven by revenue, by income, and I make no apologies for that. But almost none of those skills make great sales leaders. Great sales leaders need a whole different mindset. They have to be great listeners. They have to be kind of nimble in their thinking. They have to show great empathy. They have to have vision and strategy and execution skills. They have to realize it's no longer about you. It's about the team, that your results are in fact the team's results. Now you have to get results with and through other people. You can't rush in and save the day. You can't just do it your way. You can't berate people into performing the same behaviors or speeches or presentations that worked for you. There might be different routes to the same success. It takes a level of maturity, selflessness to be a great leader. In fact, I'm not sure everybody who's a leader should be a leader. I'll take it a step further. I'm not sure I should have been a leader of people. I'm great at a lot of things. Patience is not one of them. I'm not a naturally good listener. I have to work on my humility. I have to work on checking my own agenda, right, and being um, a little more thoughtful about accommodating other people's points of views. Those are great leadership skills. And I think too often we take the leap into leadership because we have other motivations. We want more money, that's fine. We want a higher title, that's great. We're on a career journey. But they're often the wrong motivation to become a leader. I think there's no shame in saying no to the leadership role. You know, the statistics show that the average person is promoted into their first leadership role at the age of 30. But they don't receive their first formal leadership training until they're 42. There's a 12-year wandering in the desert, if you will, where they're probably, me included, wreaking havoc on people's careers. They're well-intended. They think, well, I did it this way, so you should too. But that's not the nimble, adaptive leader of the future. When you become a leader, what got you, what worked for you there may indeed get you here, but it won't take you or them there. The skills that got you successful, that helped you become successful as a person, are really transferable into a leadership role. You have to not just change your skills, but change your mindset. Really reassess your purpose. What is your mission? What is your legacy? What is your role? What do your people need from you? And are you naturally, naturally equipped to give it to them? Do you have the desire to learn them? Or quite frankly, are you comfortable just being the person who's pounding out the results and you don't want the stress and the necessity of all the interventions and feedback and high courage conversations and clarifying purpose, repeating your message dozens and dozens and dozens of time and always being responsible for the end result. The buck stops with you. And that carefully calibrated balance between allowing your, your team to learn and grow and make mistakes and move forward recognizing that you can't take to your boss, well, my team is still in learning mode, so we missed our quarter. Nope. They got to learn on the job, and you have to deliver results and give them credit for it. It takes a certain kind of person, not good or bad or better or worse, just a different kind of person than a certain group of us that actually like to just do our job, do it extremely well, be best in class, and not have to be responsible for everybody else. Leadership's a calling. It's a choice. It's not a position. You almost don't earn your way there. You kind of earn your way into it. So I would just remind you, the first critical practice for leading a team is developing a leader's mindset. And primarily, it's that everything that worked for you as an individual producer likely will not work for you as a leader. It's fairly sobering. But I suggest in the book with my colleagues that you have a bit of a funeral. All of your President's Club awards, all of your certificates, all the, letters, the letters of commendation, put them in a box. Give it a funeral and pack them away because it's not about you anymore. It's about them. And that takes a fundamental shift in a leader's mindset to be successful. If you can't make that first shift 
The other five critical practices are irrelevant. Pick up a copy of the book, Our Leadership Solution, The Six Critical Practices for Leading a Team is available in a one-day work session. Visit franklincovey.com, click on the Leadership tab, and you'll find more about the six critical practices for leading a team. I hope you'll join us back here next week with a new guest. Thanks for listening to Scott's thoughts on developing a leader's mindset.